Could understanding your genetic makeup help you live longer? Could your genomic identity be used to predict the diseases you'll face or tailor a cancer-fighting drug just for you? Or is this more hype than promise? Hi, I'm Joe Palka, science correspondent for NPR. We're going to spend the next hour or so discussing the possibility of personalized genomics to revolutionize the delivery of medicine and improve public health. Our forum is made possible by a grant from Battelle Engineering Technology and Human Affairs Endowment Fund and co-organized by Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University School of Communication in partnership with WOSU. Joining me to discuss key issues surrounding personalized genomics is a panel of health, science, and communication experts. Misty Crane has been a medical reporter with the Columbus Dispatch since 2000. Gail Herman is a physician in molecular and human genetics at Nationwide Children's Hospital and a professor at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. She is president-elect of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Matthew Nisbet is a professor of communications at American University and an expert in policy and public affairs around health, science, and the environment. Richard Sharp is the director of bioethics research at the Cleveland Clinic and studies the promotion of informed patient decision making about genetic analyses. Suzanne Johnson is a distinguished research professor at the Florida State University College of Medicine and studies the psychology, psychological impact of genetic screening on children and families. So, Gail, let's start with you. I'm curious, we're talking about personalized genomics here. What, what does that mean to you? So, I think personalized genomics, um, what it means to me or what a lot of people would think about is your genome is all of the genetic information in the DNA in our cells. And personalizing it is to be able to use that information to make medical health lifestyle decisions. So how much does it help at this point? We're in infancy with it. I think there are some clear examples where already people are beginning to use the information um, in um, cancer diagnosis, tailoring treatment to the particular genetic signature of a cancer, um, in diagnosing some rare disorders that uh, maybe traditional gene-by-gene -gene hunting haven't been able to find causes. And then there are a few very important examples in um, drug treatment where understanding a person's um, susceptibility or metabolism of a particular drug can make it much safer um, and eventually much more cost effective in terms of treatment. So Misty, you've just finished uh, writing a, a series about this whole field. Where do you think things stand in terms of public understanding? I mean, do they expect that this is going to transform their lives tomorrow or in a year or in a decade? What do you think? I think they don't know, really. They, the readers who, who I heard from were fascinated. Some of them said they were scared. You know, they, some of them want to go get their whole genome sequenced now, and they want to know as much as possible. It really... The public is all over the place when it comes to what they understand about this, and uh, I think that scientists might be surprised how very little they do understand, even when it comes down to just, just the basics about genetics. Uh, there's, there's a long distance from sixth grade when we learn the, the double helix to, to being a grown-up making medical decisions that might be based on genetics. So Richard, I'm wondering now, uh, Misty said scared. Is there, what would you think this fear is arising from? I'm not sure I would uh, express, uh, express it in quite the same way. I, I think many people in the public are actually very excited about this. Um, we, we live in an era in which medical care is increasingly depersonalized, in which people feel very alienated from their physicians. They feel alienated from medical institutions and so forth. And the idea that there would be medical care that would be tailored to your unique needs as an individual, that would help you to avoid uh, adverse reactions to drugs and so forth. Uh, all of that's something that I think a lot of people are very excited about. Uh, so I'm not sure that I would agree that uh, there's a lot of scare around this. I think there's actually a great deal of optimism about personalized medicine. So Matthew, do you think there's too much optimism? Has the media raised expectations unrealistically? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we, we really have to be careful in how we communicate about the promise of, of this research. Uh, hearing Misty and you know what I've been able to read, uh, you know, if it's if this research is uh, is commonly often referenced in the media as sort of revolutionizing uh, medicine, but it seems in reality that the the research really isn't uh, quite ready for uh, for prime time yet. That the reality is, like in most areas of science. Uh, research and clinical applications are going to move forward pretty slowly, uh, pretty incrementally, uh, and in clumsy ways. Um, and right now, it seems that the research is most relevant to a small group of high-risk people. But I'm not sure if that's the public perception of the potential of the research or how it's being conveyed in some news stories, but particularly in the direct-to-consumer advertising. So I think a real critical thing to think about is for research institutions, universities, other research institutes, within this information environment where there's uh, essentially a lot of hype, uh, how can research institutions and individual scientists uh, move forward cautiously in how they communicate about the potential uh, of the science? Dale, go ahead. Yeah, I think when you talk about research and move cautiously, I think no group was more surprised than geneticists at how fast this field took off and moved. moved. I mean, the first of these new kind of genetic sequencers were developed maybe now five years ago. A couple of years ago, we were starting to talk about it. Now at our scientific meetings, it's major talks, um, hundreds of talks out of a, a major meeting, and people are doing this clinically. So it's it's moved so fast that um, I think, you know, whether you say the horse is out of the barn, we have to deal with all of the implications of this and to say we should go slow, I think um, it, it's too late for that in a lot of ways. But it, this, this flood of information is um, more uh, basic information about things that are related, but is it really translating to clinical therapy? Um, it's not translating to changes in therapy except in a few cases. I think the cancer field, um, some drug metabolism. So again, the ability to do the sequence to, to show the GATCs up and down for millions and billions of bases is there. Um, how to interpret it and then how to turn the interpretation into useful therapies, that's what's still down the road in most cases, I think. Suzanne? Well, I think the other thing I, I wanted to make a point was that I, I think that there was a lot of excitement and hope that once we sequence the entire human genome, we could find this gene and you knew you were gonna get this disease. And it turns out there's not very many diseases like that. It turns out that um, knowing your genetic information only gives you a little bit of um, information about whether you're gonna go on to get the disease. And so for many diseases, we're actually looking at what we call gene environment interactions. So there's some sort of interaction with the gene and the environment, but we don't know what it is. So um, there, it is exciting. I agree with you, Richard, it's exciting. But um, the promise, uh, I think, I agree with Matthew, I think the promise is going to take quite a while for it to, to really translate into meaningful clinical applications. So I mean, just to, to add that, so for, from a communication st standpoint, to think about how, what are the stories we tell about research in the media and how is the public coming to understand it now? So to me, the relevant question that journalists should be asking and that we need to try to emphasize in, in thinking about preparing the public in a way that's, uh, uh, that doesn't oversell the promise of the science, because if you oversell the promise of the science, and predictions prove not to be true, which has often happened in genetic research, you risk public trust. Uh, but the relevant question is for most people, um, in terms of prediction and prevention, uh, down the road, how clinically relevant will be uh, this science for them relative to other things that we can predict pretty well relative to their health, so their, their weight, 
their cholesterol, their blood pressure. Um, and then if people have genetic information, um, you know, how do we know that will change behavior? Because we give them information about cholesterol now and weight and things. Even if a person has a heart attack, they often don't change their behavior, right? So the usefulness of the science, even if it is relevant to a wider population eventually, will depend on uh, how we're able to convey that information and the structure uh, around which we enable people to act on it. So, Misty, this is, we're hearing that this is a field that has a great deal of promise and there's a lot of potential. So how do you write about it where you tell people about it in a reasonable way, but you don't oversell it, you don't overdo the expectations? Well, with any medical journalism, it's incredibly important to uh, explain the caveats. And I can't think of a better example than this. Um, you, you must tell people that this genetic predisposition isn't, it's not a slam dunk. It's not, it's not a guarantee that something is going to happen to you or not happen to you, and that it interacts very heavily with other things. You, you know, there's a lot of concern out there, and I'm sure that some people in the audience today are concerned about this, that people will get some genetic information and make decisions that are poor decisions based on that. You know, well, I can eat cheeseburgers every day because this test says I don't have an increased risk of heart disease. And as a journalist, I think it's my job to always talk about the limitations right up front, very high in every news story, and to also explain that a discovery in genetic medicine does not equate to a treatment. That, that's kind of another issue that I think is really important for us as communicators to remember and to make sure that our readers understand. Just because you found a mutation that's connected with a disease doesn't mean that there's going to be a pill for somebody to take in five years or maybe even 15. So Suzanne, I'm wondering if I can call you in on, on this question then. Do you think that doctors or companies are overselling this at this point to try to influence reporters like Misty to, to be more positive? Do you think they are putting a more positive spin on it at this point? Well, I, I'm actually more concerned about um, the direct uh, consumer advertising for genomic testing. Can you give an example um, of that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you, you can you can get you know twenty three and me. You can get your whole genome tested. But um, I work with children who have type one diabetes, and we actually now know the genes that put a child at risk for the disease. But um, even if we know you're you're at risk, uh, it doesn't mean you will get the disease. It's not that clear. And even though it has a very strong genetic load, if you have two identical twins and one has type 1 diabetes, there's less than a 50% chance the other one does. So that's why I feel very strongly that just knowing the gene isn't enough. In fact, we're doing all this, these studies now trying to find what the environmental trigger is. My concern is that a number of genetic testing companies that are actually not regulated, that's a whole other thing I hope we talk about a little bit today, are contacting families where they know they get information, there's information about you everywhere, um, they have information that there's type 1 diabetes in your family, and um, they contact you, so don't you want to come and get this genetic test, even though the genetic test will not give you any information as a parent to help you make any decisions about this child, uh, whether or not they're going to get type 1 diabetes. And that's just one example. There are many tests for many diseases. Um, so yeah, I do have some, a lot of concern about the direct-to-consumer advertising. I have more concern about that than what physicians are doing. Right. So okay, Gail, is there a tension between what physicians are telling their patients and what companies that are offering direct-to-consumer products are telling the public? I think there's some tension. Um, I think that um, just like there are good academic laboratories doing testing, there are good co some good companies. Um, not all company testing is bad. Um, and I think that we need to educate physicians, the public, all healthcare providers, um, science teachers, so that everybody becomes more savvy about these issues. So who does the education? 
a good question. <laughs> Um, we are working very hard in the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics to train uh, genetic residents and MDs, but we don't have enough going into the field. Uh, there are genetic counselors who are masters trained and specifically spend a lot of time talking with families to go over these complicated issues. Uh, there are more of them than MDs, but we're still not training enough of them. So we need to find ways to educate primary care physicians so that they can bring up with their patients in the little time that they have to spend with them um, what you might look for if you want to get your genome done. What's a good company versus a company that might not be so good? And I, I would just I want to add that. So, you know, we're dealing with a public that's very vulnerable to direct to consumer advertising. But in part, you know, starting with the map, mapping of the human genome, uh, research institutions, government agencies, political leaders, and journalists help set sort of the cultural con conditions that now uh, direct-to-consumer advertising is taking advantage of. And that's really sort of uh, in, in overselling the timeline uh, and the promise of genomics research. So let me read you a couple headlines. Uh, 1994 Time Magazine cover story, Genetics, the Future is Now. Uh, 2004, uh, Time Magazine headline, Gene Science is, uh, is Changing Our Lives. Uh, headline from another newspaper stories, is, is the laziness gene to blame for couch potatoes? The God gene, does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power? Always lost, it may be in your genes. Party animal, it may be in your genes. This is one of my favorite. Marriage problems, husband genes may be the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then finally, genes may affect popularity, research say. So this this uh, cultural frame about genes being destiny and the idea to pinpoint uh, and predict your future uh, through uh, human genome research and genetic research, uh, we're all responsible in part for setting sort of the, the cultural conditions where now these direct consumer advertising companies are taking advantage of. And so our responsibility is uh, we have to think cautiously about how we communicate about this research, but also start to unravel some of that uh, cultural storytelling that we've all contributed to. And so I think, you know, places to start are forums like this, um, you know, where you have different institutions coming together, public media, Battelle, Ohio State University, uh, Nationwide Hospital, and you're reaching influentials. You and the audience are people who talk to a lot of other people about news and information, and probably you're also people that other people look to for medical and health advice. When they see advertising uh, from 23andMe, they may actually ask you a question. What do you think of this, right? So reaching people like you and talking to them about the limits to this research is really important to prepare the wider public and to start to uh, unravel some of the, the cultural stories that we've told in the past. Speaking of you, the public, who are sitting in the audience today, we have a microphone placed in the room. And if you want to think about a question that you'd like to put to the panel, in a little while, we'll be taking some questions from the audience, so start thinking now. Richard, I want to I want to ask you: Are there any problems uh, specific to personalized genomics that raise particular red flags for an ethicist? I, I think a lot of those problems are related to these these uncertainties that we're hinting at in the conversation so far. Uh, some of those uncertainties have to do with what we might know in a few years from now that we don't know currently. So it may be the case that we can perform a genetic analysis. We can log an individual's genetic data and maintain that in, say, their electronic health record over time. And three or four years from now, we might look back at that same set of data and, and draw very different conclusions. And so one of the biggest challenges today is how do we set expectations about uh, when we'll go back to people, we'll get in touch with them later on, perhaps bring them up to speed about new findings that have emerged since they were initially tested, and also how to prepare them for all the things that we might not anticipate we're going to learn through performing some of these analyses, but just happen to turn up. Uh, so how do we counsel patients about all of those uh, various uncertainties? Sure, Gail. There's some even more basic questions when you say we. So who stores the genome information? <coughs> Who's responsible for recontacting the family? What we're sequencing now is not perfect, so we may need to do it a few times. It's, it's going to get better as we go forward. So which is the final one? 
Um, and I think those are other issues that uh, consumers, healthcare providers, I, I hope we all make these decisions rather than the government sort of coming down and saying, well, this is where it's going to be stored and everything. But these are basic questions that, that are going to have to be answered in addition to some of the more ethical ones. Go ahead. But, but there's also the, the question not only who stores it, who keeps it, but who has access to it. From a, from a scientific point of view, um, this is where the excitement and the hope is that if you could have all this genetic data on people and you found out what happened to them over time, you could actually get better and better at understanding um, the role of genes and possibly even the role of gene environmental interactions. But who would have access to the data to, go to do that? If only certain small groups, certain labs have your data and they're not going to share it with anybody else, you've sort of you've shut, shut down science. Um, I think the other issue, though, is um, the issue of whether people want this information and want to be recontacted, and people change their minds about things. So they may say, yes, I'll give you my gene, I'll give you my DNA, you know, go ahead and do the test, please recontact me, but maybe they change their mind. So you have to come up with very um, sophisticated approaches about uh, respecting people's privacy and also their choices about what they want to know. And of course, there's kids. <laughs> so you can do this on your child, but your child grows up. Who, who, owns, who owns that information? And when does the child get that information? These are all very complicated uh, ethical questions. What about the question of access? Um, you know, you're talking about who's going to be able to use the information. Let's say someone wants to get the information. Is this going to be a, a discriminatory if only for the people who have the gold-plated uh, health insurance policies or the deep pockets? So, so there's been some important legislation passed that, that helps to protect uh, genetic information, um, the most important of which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that was signed into legislation by uh, former President Bush. And that legislation actually helps to protect against inappropriate uses of genetic information by uh, health insurers and by employers. And although there are still some gaps in the coverage that relate to long-term disability coverage and life insurance, uh, th that's a really important piece of legislation because some of those access issues that we've worried about over the last decade or so are, are th I, in my opinion, very well addressed by that legislation. But there's still the issue of if you want to have the test done for a clinical indication, a uh, whole genome, whole exome, all the coding gene regions, um, insurance isn't going to pay for it now by and large and for the next few years. Medicare, Medicaid won't. And so is that creating stratification? How do you get it paid for when, in fact, it may be more cost effective to sequence all the genes than if you're looking for a rare disorder to do them one at a time, which would be paid for by insurance. So we need to change how the payers in the insurance world thinks about genomics as well um, from a medical perspective, but maybe even just from a cost perspective. As I understand it, even if you do clear the testing hurdle, and discover that you are predisposed to something, there are, there are obstacles sometimes to getting the recommended care then, increased screenings, things like that, that the insurance company might balk at. And I mean, I mean the rel relevant factor here, both from a policy standpoint, from a communication standpoint, is to understand that, you know, there's different segments of the, of the, of the population that are going to respond to this development differently. So in particular, the African American community that has a higher level of, of, of distrust of the medical community is sensitive to uh, issues of discrimination and how their medical information is used, and at the same point uh, are underinsured and don't have the social capital to rely on family members or others for advice and how to make these decisions. Um, you know that's a very that's a very important population to think about from a public engagement, from a policy standpoint, from an outreach standpoint. Um, and it's not going to happen accidentally. You can't plan <coughs> public education and communication initiatives. Um, and just think that you're going to reach uh, all the relevant uh, segments of the public that you need to reach. You actually have to programmatically invest in engaging uh, the African-American African community. The turnout at this forum 
is, uh, is a good example in that the African American <laughs> community is, is underrepresented here relative to the nature of the issue. I want to remind people that we're interested in hearing your questions and we're prepared to take some now. If you want to stand up to the microphone and ask, we'll be interested in hearing. In the meantime, I want to ask the panel, is there anybody missing from the discussion? I mean, we're talking here about the people who need to be part of the decision-making process. Are the right <laughs> people at the table having the discussion, or is there somebody missing, do you think, Matthew? Um, well, I mean, I, I would say that you, you, uh, you want to be able to involve uh, people from uh, both the faith communities and the minority communities. Uh, and people who are working on behalf of uh, patient rights, so patient advocates. Uh, those are the immediate uh, uh, stakeholders that, that come to mind. It, uh, is there a way to get them involved? I mean, is there something that is not happening? I mean, how, well, do, how do we engage? From, the, from a communication standpoint, the big problem is, is simply the problem of getting people's attention and that people have so many choices when it comes to, to information and media and so many problems that they face that getting their attention on something like personalized genomics, something that sounds very technical, uh, that they also might have uh, from, from history and from culture that they might be wary and skeptical of. Uh, they're not going to, they're not, uh, they may not seek out that information, and right now they're not going to bump into it. Uh, so you have to go to places where they're at. So you have to think about, for example, uh, you know, the fastest growing sector of the media is uh, minority-based media. Uh, Spanish language media and then ethnic media. Uh, and you have to think about how can you get stories about medical science in, in those media. You have to go to the social places where, uh, where you can reach people. So churches are a great place both to reach the African American and the Latino communities. And you have to work with influentials within those communities, church leaders, civic leaders, uh, 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 health advocates and patient advocates. Okay, we have a question, go ahead. I was wondering, um, I guess, Dr. Nisbet, you were saying earlier that um, you were a little cautious about the genetic, um, the genes being seen as kind of the code and, and the future. And I wonder if um, the pop popular perception of that, as in, you know, it's written in your genes, genes make us fat, genes make us lazy, bad husbands, whatever, um, is, is blinding not just the public, but perhaps the research institutions to the more complicated um, picture that I guess the researchers on the panel were, were saying is going to be the ultimate solution. So for instance, um, uh, epigenetics or microbiome interactions or, you know, metabolome, metabolomics, <laughs> right? So um, basically, if I asked my uncle at the Thanksgiving table about any of those three things I just said, he'd have no idea. But if I said something about genes, he'd know what I'm talking about. And maybe he's making decisions or even, let's say, um, you know, university researchers are making decisions or pharmaceutical companies are making decisions to invest in genetic research that they're not making to d invest in in a more complicated, um, holistic picture of, of the therapies. So I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, if you're seeing any disproportionate um, investment in terms of money or attention in, in genetics versus these other areas that are going to be really important in ultimate therapies. Um, well, and so it's a great question. I don't know if I... I know the complete answer, and I'd be interested to see what other people think. But um, I think that the uh, one of the real pressures is um, that uh, research institutions are now uh, being defined relative to economic development and commercialization, rather than as sites of knowledge production, education, problem solving. And when you're when you're defining the relevance uh, and the importance of science in terms of uh, economic development, then it creates this incentive then to make claims about how your science is going to directly lead to commercial and economic benefits for the state or, or, or the country. So when you have a scientific finding that comes out, even now when people are writing research grants, they're being evaluated in the research grants on its potential for commercialization and economic development. And that creates the incentive even in that process of writing the research grant, and then when your study comes out, to look back at what you promised. Right? And then that, that leads to a cycle of hype. And then there's a whole system there where research institutions, as part of their marketing and their branding, are turning research communication uh, into part of that branding and marketing uh, effort to stand out. And then journalists want attention for their stories. You know, journalists are now being evaluated on how many eyeballs do they attract on a website and what's the pass around factor. Right? So there's this huge uh, cycle towards, towards hype that then 
winnows down our attention on personalized genomics as a silver bullet to the health outcomes that we care about. And uh, so it's, it's not only uh, uh, the importance of sort of critical public uh, engagement and education on personalized genomics itself, but there's a real role for research universities to be sort of broader, sort of honest brokers about public health and medicine and to say, among the tools that we have available to us coming through the, the pipeline, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the, uh, the benefits and the costs to realizing these goals? So for example, uh, uh, you know, alleviating uh, diabetes, uh, uh, other types of health outcomes that you can, you can think about. Personalized genomics might not be the best investment uh, which is the honest answer in terms of achieving certain health outcomes that policymakers care about, even though it might be sold in that way. So I think that's uh, that's one place that we really have to think critically as a publicly funded uh, university and institutions uh, that sort of self-reflect on that. I think when you when you're asking why do we focus on the genes in, instead of some of the other factors, epigenetics, environment. Um, Sometimes I think the genes are easier to get a handle on now. Uh, the other thing is that um, I work in the autism field, and I believe, though it's certainly not proven, that the environmental factors involved may be different depending what the underlying genetic factors are, are in each family or in each case. So that if we divide the patient population based on the genetic factors, then we may be able to understand more about the environmental factors that work with those genes. So that may be another reason why people are focusing on that. I don't know, Suzanne, you probably have. Um, yeah, I I think um, so. Yes, I I do think this whole um, epigenetics and you know looking at the in interaction between the environment and genes is is the way is the wave of the future. People don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily appeal to people because it's very complicated. And um, you use the word silver bullet, I use the word magic bullet. People like the idea that they can just do a test and find out what their gene is and then they're going to have all their solutions just like the drug, drug companies in this company, this country I believe, try to convince people that the, we can solve all your problems by taking a drug. And it's interesting that a lot of the genetic testing companies are now being owned by the pharmaceutical industry. And, and just to add to that, let, let's say that um, we could uh, have a, a, a test for a strong prediction of, of something like uh, lung cancer or obesity. Um, immediately it introduces policy questions where certain industries like food companies and tobacco companies are now going to take that science and use that science to frame the social problem as an individual problem rather than something that they're part of as, as an institution or organization. They'll also start to use that as part of their targeting and marketing. These are things sort of down the road that you could envision as part of sort of the social uptake of the science. So tobacco companies for a long time have been trying to uh, develop a safe cigarette. You know, they're putting a lot of money into that. Uh, but in the future, uh, if if you had a genetic test for people who had a lower risk of lung cancer, they could now market to so-called safe smokers. Uh, same thing if someone had a low, low risk of heart disease. You know, food companies could now target you and, and, and start to uh, look at uh, uh, things that it's okay to eat fast food because you, you won't get heart disease or you won't become fat. So these are all things that we can think about, the social implications, the science, as it's you know, maybe years down the road, but these are things that we should be thinking about now in terms of both it's uh, how we develop the research and how we uh, sort of prepare the public for its implications. Another question? Yeah, and this goes along with, um, you brought up the testing, and I was just wondering if any of you or um, use any genetic testing or genomic testing uh, in your practice or you work with any practitioners that are currently using some of the genetic or genomic testing and then applying it towards therapy right now, or which um, might be applicable? What are some tools that would be used in the near future and towards certain diseases? Um, I certainly am. Um, I, I'm a clinical geneticist, and I see mostly children at uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital. 
Um, I see a lot of children with um, intellectual disability and autism, and we have a couple of standard first-tier screening tests, a special chromosome test, a couple of single gene tests, and that's pretty much what is recommended now. And I think the next test that one would do um, would be to do, at this point, the whole exome, all the coding regions. Why the coding regions rather than everything? And that's because the, the, the technology to put the, DN, the blood in, or the DNA in the machine is very similar, but the amount of information to interpret is orders of magnitude larger, and we just don't understand it as well. So we start with the coding where we have the best chance of being able to say if a change is going to cause a problem or not. Um, so I think those are fairly rare conditions. It's not like looking at someone's risk for heart disease or obesity. But those are places where a lot of uh, clinical geneticists are using this as a clinical test where you're getting results from a certified lab that you're going to give out to families. Does that sort of answer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just actually thinking now, I want to ask the audience a question before they ask us another one. Um, can I see a show of hands of how many people have had any kind of genetic test that they know about? And have, okay, so that would, what would you say, about a third, maybe, of 100 people in the audience, maybe? And how many have, have tried using a personalized, over the, you know, 23andMe, one of these companies that evaluate wow. fewer? But still That's growing. Wonderful. Yeah, this is yeah. about 10% of the audience. So this is happening. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I think that we've, we've had this question of, you know, are we going to be able to manage it? Are we going to be able to control it? It's rolling. It is. There's no question about it. And, and I wonder, you know, is there a way to put the genie back in the bottle, uh, Misty? Is there, yeah, I know. I sure it's just to put so. you on. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I sure well, don't think so. Why would you want to? I mean, maybe we'd like to make the genie a little more user friendly or something. <laughs> but to put it back in the bottle, I just, you know, th there's some risks and potential harm, but the immediate and future benefits of the information, I think, far outweigh to, to put it back in the bottle and say we're not going to do it at all. So I have a question. Are there any parallels in this situation? So 20 years ago, gene therapy was going to fix what ails us. I mean, we were going to find the bad gene, replace the bad gene, you're all better now, the bad gene is gone. Uh, didn't turn out that way. In fact, uh, there were, uh, you know, there was a medical case where a, a subject in an experiment died unexpectedly, or perhaps not so unexpectedly, depending on how you read the data. But um, is there a, is there a, is there a something that could happen in genetic medicine, personalized genomics, that might set this field back? I wonder, has anybody thought about that? You want to take that? Take a shot at that. I, I think this is really quite different, and I think in what's the the big difference is that gene therapy was interventional, and you never really know what might happen when you introduce some new medium into the human body. And the risks that we're talking about when we're talking about personalized medicine are informational risks, and in many ways uh, they don't pose the same danger to individuals, but they're also things that once once we identify them, we might be able to manage a little better. So if the risks are threats involving privacy, we'll develop privacy protections that will help to mitigate those risks. And so for, to me, I actually think that the dangers that we associate with personalized medicine are really are quite different and really uh, degrees of magnitude lower than some of our earlier experiences with things like gene therapy. I mean, I think a risk you could think of something like you get your genome done, you find out you have a very high breast cancer risk, you get scared, and you have a mastectomy. I mean, that's physical harm from misinformation. So I think some degree of caution, buyer beware. I mean, not all the information is going to be correct, and not all of it's going to be helpful. And I think that's where the harm at this point could come, that someone takes data that they think means one thing and it's either wrong or it really doesn't mean that and they go out and take an action that could be harmful personally. I agree that misinformation is probably the greatest risk here, that people make decisions based on something they don't understand or don't understand well. I, I heard some really um, upsetting stories when I was reporting the series about 
people being told by physicians, okay, your your BRCA test came back positive. Here's, What's that again? It, it's a breast cancer mutation. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a risk an increased risk for breast cancer. You have to go have your ovaries and breasts removed now. Well, that woman doesn't have to do that. Not not by a long shot. And that's what her physician told her. So the the misinformation could certainly lead to some to to some negative outcomes. So I, yeah, I just want to add to that. So the way that personal genomics has been uh, sold has been as a way to empower patients, right? But th this is a good example where, in fact, actually, the, the the patient perceptually in reality is actually disempowered, where they get this feeling of certainty that they are going to have cancer. The doctor tells them something, and then they feel compelled to do it because now that the certainty is there. Um, and so I, I think there are some trade-offs here. One is is trust. So we, we just know from the history of studying uh, how how new technologies, new research emerges, that often very bold predictions are made. And those predictions have been made from human genome research to personalized genomics. Francis Collins is a good example uh, of some of the, the statements that he's made about the potential of this research. And when those predictions prove not to be true, stem cell research is another good area, what at risk there is, is uh, public trust. So 23andMe, you know, for people who are not in those high-risk uh, categories of people, right, once they learn that really, well, they, you know, they spent a lot of money and this is really sort of uh, diversionary sort of entertainment information, or they've actually tried to make, pers they've actually made major life decisions based on this information that probably is not that predictive and they should have been paying attention to things like their cholesterol, their weight, their exercise, right? Um, trust is at risk and it's also distracting. It's misplaced. It's also potentially distracting from where we can actually make impacts right now in terms of different types of public health outcomes. So so our medical professional organization has been trying to work very hard to address some of these issues. Um, we can only make recommendations and not everyone's going to read them, hear them, or follow them. But again, the more we can get our message out. So one of our recommendations has been that everyone who undergoes complete genome or exome sequencing have uh, pre- and post-test counseling by a qualified genetics professional to try to address some of those issues, and that there be a detailed written consent that they go through. Um, there will still be people who may misunderstand, but we think that this is complicated enough and there are enough nuances that it really, you really need to take the time um, to discuss all these things with someone who knows at least a fair amount about it. We're, we're all still learning, but um, your primary care physician, if he's not familiar with this at all, probably should say, you know, if you want to do this, maybe you ought to go talk to someone who knows more about it. Richard. It's, it's such early days, I think, in personalized medicine that it's hard to say what the, the risk or the benefits are, but uh, there have been enough people that have pursued this in a direct-to-consumer environment uh, that people have actually been able to study the outcomes of those tests and to interview people and, and do surveys of individuals who've actually uh, received direct-to-consumer products. And the, the overall story that's emerging is a story that, uh, in which people are not significantly more anxious based upon the results that they receive. And although they initially report that they're going to be more likely to take steps to um, mitigate these risks, to go to the gym more often, to change their diet and what have you, when you talk to them six months later or nine months later, you actually find that they haven't made those changes. So neither great levels of anxiety nor a great <laughs> impact in terms of people actually taking actions to uh, improve their health. Maybe they can just send me the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's but, take that, a, but that finding oh. goes then to the, to the, the <coughs> efficacy of, 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 of the science for behavior change, right? So, you know, if, if, if six months out people haven't committed to making those changes that their doctor advised them on and that the test has come back and advised them on, then that presents a real problem for how the science might translate into into actual health outcomes. Or it also could mean that at this point in time, the information you get back are a few genes, not all of them, and that the risk change that they give you is pretty small. That when you're dealing with a 1.5 times risk 
Um, what does that mean? And it really is not changing your overall risk. It's still the diet, the exercise, and all that have much more influence. And so I think we have to separate, and everyone needs to become more um, knowledgeable about when you have a 50% risk uh, or even higher. If you have the BRCA1, this breast cancer gene, you have a bad mutation, your lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is in the probably 80 to 90 percent range versus you've got one of probably many genetic or environmental factors that might make it a little more risky that you're going to develop heart disease, but not twofold or tenfold. The one risk that, that we know and, and has been nicely documented by the group at Partners Healthcare is a risk of medical overutilization. So uh, in a study that they did uh, last year, they found that um, the individuals who receive direct-to-consumer testing often go into their primary care physicians and ask questions about the results that they've received. And those physicians are quite likely to order very various diagnostic tests based upon that information just to resolve any uncertainty that those patients may have. And that might result in thousands and thousands of dollars worth of unnecessary diagnostic tests being ordered. Right, so like the, the worried well sort of have, you know asking for a full body scan and yep. being able to afford it. but. Let's take one more question from the audience. Um, as we try to generate a larger public discussion on personalized genomics, I'm curious to know what has happened in the past with, let's say, countries like Iceland, where they have a massive amount of genetic data. How has that impacted their society, scientifically, clinically, socially, and what can we learn from that in, in our system? Does anybody know the Iceland experience? There's certainly been a lot of genetic information that's come out of Iceland. There were companies that were specific to Iceland and were able to determine a lot. Um, I, does anyone have any direct knowledge of what's happening in terms of individual clinical care? I don't. I mean, I know the studies, um, they got a large percentage of the population and they uh, were able to do whole genome sequencing, but in terms of impact on the population, change in their behaviors, I'm, I really don't. You've stumped the panel. Yeah. <laughs> Do you but have knowledge you can tell us? I, I don't, but I'm wondering, you know, what does it mean for us to amass all right. this data, and where are we going to get? So, the, so I'll just, since she's off mic, I'll just say, she, the question is, what, 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 if we have all this data, how it's going to change our behavior? And I guess the answer for us is we don't know yet, right? Because we're going to have it at some level. But yeah. I, I, I think it, it does get at this, you know, so this related uh, aspect of, uh, you know, policy and communication about biobanking. And, uh, you know, the, the, the book by Rebe Rebecca Skloot, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, it's being made into an HBO movie. I mean, millions of people have now read this book, and more will see the, see the movie. It's being assigned in colleges and high schools and churches and, and libraries. Uh, it's a powerful personal story, but it's it is it's uh, it's also a tool for engaging the public on questions about privacy, informed consent, uh, these aspects about uh, access to data, uh, uh, control over your information or your tissue after it it leaves your body. Uh, so I think it's it's both uh, it's both a potentially a problem because. Uh, the overall framing of the discussion has been the only thing that matters is informed consent. Uh, these other issues don't matter as long as you have informed consent. Uh, most other things go. That's how it's been discussed in the media. Uh, but from a, from a public engagement standpoint, it's actually a real opportunity for bioethicists and scientists to use a book like that, a cultural product, as, as an entry point into a wider discussion of, of these issues. I think we can take one more question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the question of advertising and how do you kind of package this to the public has come up a good amount, and I was curious as to whether the panel has seen examples of good advertising that has gotten across personalized genomics and what it is and educating, helping to educate the public on it, and what the different standpoints are of, from a communication standpoint, what are you trying to get across about personalized genomics, and from research science uh, what are the goals to educate the public on? Suzanne, can I put you on the spot on well, this Well, you know, a good example of good advertising, I, I'm a little stumped on that one. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, you know, I, I do think, though, um, 
Mm -hmm. the, can't, the, the breast cancer gene that we've talked about is a really good example of one where um, we know a lot about it, and um, I think we can communicate to families who, who have this gene in their um, family history uh, to have these important discussions. Um, so, but that is typically done, in my experience, by a physician, um, a knowledgeable physician, and as Gail said, with usually with a genetic counselor. Um, I guess what I, one uh, I want I want to disagree a little bit. I don't know if Gail and I really disagree or not, but I, I don't. I, this director consumer advertising thing, what is bothering me? It isn't. I don't think the solution is educating the public. I think the public should be educated, of course, always. But I don't think it should be the public's responsibility to figure out whether a lab will give you an accurate, reliable, valid result. I mean, when you go to a pharmacy and you, I mean, we have an FDA that approves drugs. I mean. So, so that's my concern. I mean, I think there needs to be some regulation and standards so that if a, if a g company is going to do these genetic tests and you pay thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars for this test, that you know you're going to get an accurate result that means something. So I think um, we agree in the sense that, um, yes, there needs to be some supervision and regulation, but when we talk about the FDA, we're talking about drugs. And while they do regulate some test kits and all, pregnancy tests and um, amino acid analyzers, the chemicals on them and all, when you start talking about DNA sequencing, it's a whole different kind of animal in terms of how do you regulate what's an analyte. If you sequence one gene, is that different and you have to start over if you're going to the next gene and if you can do two genes is it really such a big leap to say you're going to do 20,000 and the FDA is just not really equipped or have the the knowledge base or the inspectors or people to do this so they often rely on CLIA to certify CLIA? labs um, I knew you were going to ask me and yeah, I actually sorry. looked up so it's it's say it's sufficient to say that it's right. It's a it's an organization that's that responsible for certifying, certifying labs. clinical labs to perform tests properly. But they don't test the testers that much. They just say, make sure that you're doing it right, and we wish you well. Well, that's not actually true. So, <laughs> okay. um, at least the the labs I know. Um, so they do come around and they do inspections and they send out samples um, that are blinded for people to. Um, for labs to analyze, and uh, they record if you get it right or wrong, and if too many labs get it wrong, then pathologists and geneticists, at least with genetic tests, kind of go back and say, well, we better train people better and differently. So there is a movement to try to get CLIA and genetics and pathology organizations involved in how to regulate these types of tests. Um, but to just say the FDA ought to lump it in with all the other kinds of things they do, I think would not be in the best interest of the public because um, it, it probably would not get done right or for decades. So, so I just wanted to, I'm not pushing the FDA. I'm just pushing some sort of regulation by an appropriate group so that if you get a genetic test result, you have some reasonable assurance you're actually getting accurate information. I think we'd agree on that, yeah. We found common ground, good, <laughs> go ahead. So we spent a lot of time in medical education trying to teach medical students and junior doctors the clinical useful utility of a test. And when should they order it? When is it indicated? Even for like a $30 urinalysis. And now we're talking about a plethora of information that's very complex. And so my question, I guess, for Dr. Herman is, <laughs> what are organizations like yours doing to, because outside of the research setting, there are a few clinical indications for this test, as I understand it, to organizations like yours doing to develop what should those indications be and educate not just the physicians, but now with 23andMe, the population about 
When should I do this? When should I be advised to do it? So there, we have come out with a list of um, indications to use whole genome screening as a diagnostic test. There's, it's pretty short. Um, there are also some indications that we feel when is it appropriate as a screening, and I think that's what you're talking about more for pharmacogenomics or other things. Um, we feel very strongly now there are some instances where it shouldn't be used. Prenatal screening, we're, we're nowhere close to that. Newborn screening, maybe in the future, but the methods we have based on dried blood spots are much better, much faster, more accurate than to say we're going to use our whole genome for, for that. Um, I think it really depends on the situation. For the rare diagnostic test, when you have a lot of heterogeneity, different genes that can cause the same disease, um, those are places where it's starting to get used. In terms of clinical utility for um, pharmacogenomics for cancer, I think that practice guidelines that groups like ours, like um, the cardiologists, like the oncologists, uh, they're going to come out with statements about when is this clinically helpful. Well, I'm sure the panel and the audience will agree that it's remarkable how in just one hour we've resolved all these complicated, <laughs> <laughs> complicated issues, but I have a feeling there may be future discussions to behold. So I'd just like to thank the panelists for a very informative discussion on how to engage the public around this topic. I'm Joe Palka of NPR. Thank you for watching.